Oh, I believe it's camp meeting time. Come on in here. It's uh, 5.30 in the evening, and I know that's a little early, but I'd rather get started on time <clears throat> and give God time. I'm excited already. I've been talking to people from Ohio and Texas, Texas or Oklahoma, and uh, I think I saw some Georgians here somewhere. Yeah, I tell you, them hooting and hollering Georgians. What will we do without them? And, and then there's some folks from Missouri here. And then there's some folks from Florida I see over there. Yes, sir. Where are you all from right here? Oklahoma. Boy, amen. Well, we're just glad you all are here, and we'll be doing a little bit more of that later. I just want to go over two or three things before we get started tonight and uh, uh, just uh, kind of lay out kind of what's going on, what you can expect, and so forth. But I do have kind of a rough announcement, but God's in charge. I got a call from Brother Larry Brown about 6 o'clock yesterday afternoon. And uh, first of all, he said, Reggie, they delayed our flight indefinitely when we, that we were supposed to fly down on. So I told my booking agent, I said, get uh, anywhere. I don't care if I have to go to New York and back to Missouri. He said, just, he said we tried St. Louis, Oklahoma City, Denver, and no, could not get a connection. So he said, we're just going to drive. So they took off from their house last night to drive down here, and, or yesterday afternoon to drive down here, and 12 miles from home, she had one of her major teeth to split right up into her root, and it sent her into an electric orbit. but you know how that is. And um, so he had to take her to the dentist, and they had to cut that thing out, and of course you know how that gets into it, and so she's laying up there, and she was crying and begging him to go on down here, and he said, I ain't going to leave you, and and anyway, why, I said, Larry, you better stay with your wife. And so far as I know, they won't be here unless she talks him into it. But boy, I want to tell you something. I want God to be here. Amen. And I just want you all to have a good time in the Lord. We ain't got no agenda but exalting the Lord Jesus Christ. Boy, I tell you what's good to see the old Kabul people down there, Texas County people over there. How are you anyway? You can't help who you're related to, can you? <laughs> But uh, two or three things I want to go over. Uh, as again, I said, Bishop, we're just so glad there's more people there, people coming in tomorrow and, and so forth. But I, we want you to worship. We want you to worship the Lord. And you know, the night I got saved and surrendered to preaching, January 24th, 1982, I'd have, I couldn't tell you what the men preached on to save my life. If they said, Reg, we're going to hang you if you can't tell us what he's preaching on, I'd have to get hung because I don't remember. But I do remember somebody talking to me as the Lord. And uh, regardless of what everybody else is doing, God met with me that night. And I want him to do that with you this week. And, you know, that you may be listening to a preacher and you may not be getting anything out of it. But I tell you, God can still speak to us. And I want you to worship. I want you to draw close to the Lord. And uh, I want you to rest. I really believe with all my heart that well, one of the things that God's doing in this camp meeting is making a place where people can kind of come apart and rest a little bit in the Lord. You know, Jesus told his disciples, come apart and rest a while. And Jesus said, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. We're living in a pretty bad, it ain't the best of times in this country. And uh, But I tell you what, uh, we've got the Lord, and we just want you to rest. We want you to rejoice. We want you to be revived in the Lord. We want you to kind of get recharge your battery up a little bit. And one of the things I really pray is that, especially among preachers, they can leave here with a, with a renewed vision to, to go for God and, uh, and be encouraged. Let me tell you something. Things don't happen overnight a lot of times. We've been here 40, uh, 42 years, and God just keeps moving us forward a little all the time. So, and, uh, but I learned one thing back when I was young. Go get your battery charged. And I'd go someplace and seem like the Lord would speak to me while I was there and give me thoughts and ideas and so forth. And I want you to know something else tonight, that this there is no boundaries about I don't care if we're singing, somebody's preaching, or what's going on. You want to come up and pray around the altar area, out there in the back somewhere? I don't care. You obey the Lord, Amen. and uh, you want to come and pray. You going bother. There's no time that this altar is not open. This prayer, this old morning bench is not open for you to come to. Okay, and if you come with burdens, you know what? He's a burden lifter. Well, I'm gonna try to keep him preaching. Anyway, uh, good. If kind of the. Um, by the way, let me just say this tonight. This is not some preacher contest. I want to get that down solid. 
This ain't no preaching contest. We're not up here trying to figure out who we like the best or this, that, or the other. Uh, pre preachers are different. Thank God they are. And uh, each one has his own gifts from God and so forth. But I don't want any of you preachers or nothing like that. Don't you, you, you throw that right out of your head, right out of your mind. And don't you worry about what people think. You just obey the Lord and preach what he puts on your heart and you'll be all right. Our theme this year is holiness unto the Lord. Lord gave this to me several months ago. As I began to, as I was reading and just meditating the Word of God, and that just seemed like uh, the Lord really dealt with me on that. Last year, our theme was to the glory of God. And I got to thinking about it. You know how to bring glory to God? Live holy unto the Lord. That'll bring holy. And I believe there's every time in our, in our nation is people need to get back to holiness unto the Lord. Now, let me say something regarding that before everybody starts preaching. I'm not interested, I don't, and I know God ain't, in fake holiness. Not putting on some dog about, well, I'm going to act holy. <clears throat> Jesus had to deal with that nonsense. We're just talking about good, clean living, obeying God, and doing right. You know, not putting on no airs or nothing like that. But I tell you, God's people ought to do right. Amen? Ought to be honest. And live holy before the Lord. And that starts internally. And then it'll work itself to the external. But the internal is the most important thing. And so uh, let's let God speak to us. Service schedule uh, is uh, in the morning at 7 o'clock. We'll have prayer meeting right here. 8 o'clock, free breakfast there in the gym. Going to a lot of work. You be here for that breakfast, okay? Be here for the prayer meeting. And then we'll come out here at about 9 o'clock, 9.30, and we're going to take in again preaching and singing and, and praying and just worshiping the Lord. We'll go to noon. At noon, we'll let I have the afternoon off. If you say, Reggie, tell me some place to go or something to do while the afternoons, get a hold of me. I'll try to help you find a place to go. There's some kind of neat places to go in this part of the country. Look at old boy from Oklahoma back there. He, I tell you, good to see you. Uh, you know who I'm looking at right there. And uh, anyway, uh, so that's the schedule then. Sunday morning, we will not have the breakfast. We'll have, we'll have service to start in here about 9.30. Go to noon. We're having a big church dinner on Sunday, this Sunday. So we'll have a big pot of whatever you call them, church dinner on the grounds. And then Sunday night, we'll start having church again at 530. Monday morning, we'll have our prayer meeting again at 7, breakfast at 8, and of course service and go to noon, break, and then finish out Monday night if the Lord allows that. So that's kind of the schedule as far as we know. Now, uh, we sing a song around here a lot, and it's called this. You sing with me. Brethren, we have met to worship and adore the Lord our God. Will you pray with all your power while we try to preach the word? All is vain, let the Spirit of the Holy One come down. Brethren, pray and holy man will be showered on. Stand together for prayer, and then Brother Ben's going to come and lead us in song. And we have the we have the singing police out tonight. If you ain't singing, they'll arrest you, and you'll have to sing a solo by yourself. They'll be coming around making sure you're singing. All right? No, seriously, I I, I gauge a, a, a meeting spiritual life to to how enthused the people are about singing. Amen. I don't believe we ought to sing like a do, dead dead cat to God. Amen. I believe you ought to sing with joy in your heart and lift it up to the Lord. And so I ask you to do that tonight. Father in heaven, we bow before you. We're opening up this camp meeting, God. We've got four days or three and a half days, whatever it is. And God, we're asking you to meet with us. Lord, I pray that we might honor your holy name. You'd lift up the Lord Jesus Christ and preach the gospel. And preach the word of God so folks could get some help from heaven. I pray, God, that you'll bind Satan and keep him off his property. Keep him off of this services, Lord. I pray, God, give us a divine love for each other, shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost. I pray, Lord, help us to appreciate each other and to encourage each other and to love each other with unfeigned love of the brethren. God, I pray, especially tonight, help these preachers as they preach. Strengthen them, anoint them, Lord. God, I pray that you'll move among us, Lord. As we sung there, Lord, just move, unless the Spirit of the Holy One comes, it's all in vain. God, we came 
to meet with you tonight. And Lord, Lord, I know that you're all present. But Lord, I pray you'll do a special visitation here this week. In Jesus' precious name I pray. Amen. Yeah. Well, sit down and grab your songbook. And these people are going to sing. Brother Glidden, you somewhere in the neck of the woods here. And we're going to sing. What page are we singing? 307. 307 in your songbook. 307. Number 307. Revive us again. Hallelujah. Thine the glory. Let's sing it out tonight from our hearts unto the Lord. Number 307. Verse number three. Revive us again, you men stand singing when it says what the I think he read my mind. I was just gonna say the same thing. Hey folks, there's chairs. you folks out yonder, how you doing? Good to have you. What you're from Washington State, you're the Steinman's aren't you? I remember you. There's some chairs up here somewhere. Don't stand back here all the time. This whole world was empty. They went after some? Okay, all right. Well there's a whole road right up here on spitting chairs. <laughs> They're free. <laughs> all right, here's here's what we got to do, all right? Well, let me encourage you, first of all, with one thing here that will help your singing. I tell this to the choir all the time. A lot of times when we're singing, our mind can kind of wander. And this, on that, we're not really focused on the words. They just kind of come off our lips. Let me encourage you tonight, focus on the words of the song if you're saved tonight, these songs, these words will bring joy to your heart and you won't be able to help but smile and sing with all your heart as you rejoice and, and as you echo the words of these hymn writers tonight, all right? So let's focus on the words as we sing. Now here, as Pastor read, I, I think he really read my mind tonight because I was going to sing Brethren We Have Met to Worship, but it wasn't in the book. So I'm glad he did that to start tonight, but I do want to do something different on verse 3. When we get to the chorus, I want the men to start with hallelujah and the ladies to echo with amen. Again, hallelujah, amen, hallelujah. That, oh, and we got to stand up. you got to stand up on your word, okay? We'll get all wide awake here. All right, so we're going to have a lot of jumping up and down, those of you that can. And then on verse 4, we'll flip it the other way around, okay? And the ladies will have hallelujah, and the men will echo it with amens, okay? We got that? All right, let's sing verse 3. All glory, this is good, all glory and praise to the Lamb that was slain. Let's sing it to him tonight. All glory and praise to the Lamb that was slain, who has borne all our sins and has cleansed. Some of you are a little slow there, but let's see if we can do it a little better on the fourth verse, all right? Let's switch it around, okay? On the fourth, revive us again, fill each heart with thy love. Revive us again, fill each heart with thy love. May soul be rekindled with thy Hi, ladies. Much better that time. Praise the Lord. Thank you for your good participation in that time. <laughs> Some of you were sitting down when you were supposed to be getting up. And it was, it, I wish we had that. Did you have it on camera, Joel? We'll show that again at the end of the meeting so everybody can see that. Well, that was good. It's good to, it's good to enjoy ourselves in the war, right? 
Uh, the words of these songs are so precious, but I don't think that the Lord minds if we enjoy ourselves a little bit while we do it. And so we'll have a little fun throughout the weekend here and there. And uh, But most of all, we'll just sing unto the Lord with all our hearts. Let's turn to number 71 now. Number 71, another good old familiar song. On Christ the solid rock I stand. My hope is built on nothing but us. And Jesus' blood and righteousness. Let's sing that out tonight from our hearts. On number 71, on the first stanza. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and Righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest flame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. For when darkness sinks in I rest on Him. tonight when he shall come with it could be this weekend the trumpets and sound let's sing it out tonight on that floor oh when he shall come with trumpets sound oh may I then in him be found rest in his righteousness Tell you what, now it's already getting my soul started up. Amen. Now listen, it ain't gonna hurt you to say amen. amen. Now you get that, you break loose, you ain't home, Jesus. So all right, we won't tell on you. No, I'm just teased you. It's so good to see everybody. I want you to turn around and say, I'm glad you're here too. What's your name? Where are you from? And and uh, just meet somebody and greet somebody. Would you do that tonight for just a minute? Choir, thank you for singing. I want Lucas to get up here and ready to preach. We're going to keep this thing, we're going to keep the train rolling. Lucas, you better be getting around. Hey, buddy, how you doing? How are you, man? Good. Oh, listen, would you give that to my wife so I don't get rid of it there? And uh, there, thank you so much. All right. Give you just a little bit there to visit, and uh, I'll just say again, all you backsliders over in the tents, you ought to get here. You know, no, we're glad you're back here. All them chairs in the tent back here is nearly full. We're just so glad you're here. And the hope that you can hear. I want to say a great big hallelujah thank you to my Heavenly Father for answering our prayers about the weather. Amen. Well, I'll tell you something. They was talking pretty rough all week long. And they was pointing at us. And I said, now, Lord, I would like you to dissipate them clouds and just kind of make them go around us and bless somebody else with the rain and let us have that prayer meeting with 73 degrees and a light breeze. Are you about what we got, ain't it? 
And I, I just think it's funny watching the Lord just do wonderful things. Uh, come here, Lucas. I, I tell you what, I'm blessed here as a pastor. I've got about eight or ten, twelve preachers. And this is the last one that surrendered to preach, I think. I don't think anybody's surrendered to preach since you have, is he? Don't, you don't know. You don't keep track of that very well, do you? This is Lucas. This is a, a Brother Jason's son and his daughter. His, and, and, you, both of your son, isn't he? Yeah. <laughs> Brother Carl, this ain't going too good so far. And um, But he is a priest. They all preach on Wednesday nights. A lot of the different men do. And uh, I've given him 10 to 15 minutes. You preach what God's put on your heart. You help him preach. They've got about four seats up here on the front. If somebody needs one, they're sure up here available to you, okay? And then his daddy's going to come preach after he gets done. We'll have Brother Glidden will have about a, a verse or just barely a verse or two, and he'll get his daddy in the saddle. They've been down to Mexico in mission work, and they're back now. And I just thought it'd be kind of neat to start off with a boy and his dad that's both been called to preach and get this thing started. Lucas, you just preach what God puts on your heart. Pray for him. He's hooked up here, and he's all right. I think so. The evening. All right, turn your Bibles to Proverbs fourteen seventeen. He that is soon angry dealeth foolishly, and a man of wicked devices is hated. Um, my, uh, title of my message is Don't Be Angry. This is something the Lord has been dealing with me about, you know, you know. Brothers and sisters and stuff, you know, they get on your nerves and you get angry. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> so if you have a problem with anger, I hope this helps you. Uh, turn to Proverbs 29, 8. Scornful men bring a city into a snare, but wise men turn away wrath. Uh, Proverbs 15.1 A soft answer turneth away wrath, but grievous words stir up anger. Um, if you'll turn to Judges. Uh, Judges 8.3 I know, 8, 1 through th 3. Um, uh, Gideon had just won out and killed like Zeb and Zalmunna, the princes of Midian. And uh, now the me uh, men of Ephraim are mad at him because he didn't ask them to go and fight. Um, and the men of Ephraim said unto him, Why hast thou served us thus, that thou callest us not when thou went wentest to fight with the Midianites? And they did chide with him sharply. So they like fought with him, you know. And, uh, and he said unto them, What have I done now in comparison of you? Is not the gleaning of the grapes of Ephraim better than the vintage of uh, um, Abiezer? God hath delivered into your hands the princes of Midian, Oreb, and Zeb. And what was I to, able to do in compa comparison of you? Then their anger was ab abated toward him when he had said that. Well, like I said, he did, gave him a soft answer and turned away the wrath. If, uh, if somebody's mad at you, you give him a soft answer and don't blow up at him. He could have went and said, well, I, um, I'm stronger and you know, why would I ask you? I can do it on my own. Could have fought and stuff, but he went and gave him a soft answer. Um, turn to Proverbs 14:17. He that is soon angry dealeth foolishly, and a man of wicked devices is hated. Um, then Proverbs 19:19. 19, 19. A man of great wrath shall suffer punishment, for if thou deliver him, yet thou must do it again. Then 12 um, Proverbs 12:16. A fool's wrath is presently known, but a prudent man covers shame. Turn to 1429, chapter 1429. He that is slow to wrath is of great understanding, but he that is hasty of spirit exalteth folly. Um, Proverbs 
Proverbs 22:24. Make no sh- friendship with an angry man, and with a furious man thou shalt not go, lest thou learn his ways and get a snare to thy soul. No. If you're going to be angry, other people sh- are going to be your friends, and you shouldn't be f- being friends with other people because then you get angry. Enter into Psalms 30, 4 through 5. 4 through 5. Sing unto the Lord, O ye saints of his, and give thanks at the remembrance of his holiness. For his anger endureth but a moment, and his favor is life. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. So, you might go going through trials, but, you know, he has new mer- and You might get mad at God, but his mercies are new every morning. He might be mad at you because you're bad. So, um, um but... <laughs> but, but, uh, I think it's important that you don't be angry because when you're angry, even even if you don't never met a person, they see you being angry. And they're like, well, I don't want to be, I don't want to talk to him. And it can ruin your testimony being, you know. And sometimes it's pretty hard loving people and not, you know. So, um, but. So if you have a problem with anger, just read your Bible and I hope you get something from this and thank you. Something needs to be preached all over again. If you need anybody else to pray for, pray for me. subject to start off the camp meeting with. <clears throat> God sobered me up real fast when he read that verse. <clears throat> Keegan, where you at? You around here somewhere? That boy over there works with me or has been working for me for several weeks. <clears throat> Keegan, I got a problem with anger, ain't I? And when you're a pastor and a guy, boy, the teenage boy who works at church goes to work with you, Jim, and you blow up, that can hurt him. Bible says anger rests in the bosom of fools. And I just that's been one of my besetting sins over the years. Just get irritated. Everything's supposed to go just right, you know, right? The car's not supposed to break down. Everything's supposed to go right. But I've thought a lot of times I had to apologize to him and the co-worker this week. And uh, the second he said, I'm going to preach on anger, it's like the Lord said, we're starting with you, Reg. Starting with you. So I, I just want to say before God, I, I pray before I die, it'll improve, and God will do a work of grace in my heart. Uh, because Brother Larry Brown said one time when he was preaching here, he said, I, 
I wouldn't give you a dime for a man that's angry, but I wouldn't give you a nickel for a man that don't have a little bit for the right thing. That's a pretty wise statement. There's a time to have some anger. But anger has hurt more marriages, more families, more churches. And one of the worst things in the world. And uh, I thank God for that message, Lucas. I prayed, Lucas. I said, who do you want, Lord, who do you want me to have to start preaching? And uh, he's, he's, you're who I laid on, he laid on my heart. And now I kind of see that better. So I want to ask y'all to do something. Would y'all write down your Bible leaf? Lord, pray for Reg, help me remind, pray for Reg Kelly for his anger problem. Would you just do that for me maybe this week? But pray for Reg. I don't want to kill my testimony and what bring reproach to the Lord over that kind of stupidity. Because it is not wise. It is not wise. Soft answer. Hard to come by for me. All right. Brother Gidden, Gidden Glidden, come on up here. We're going to have one. Uh, his daddy's coming to preach. They're getting hooked up back here. You come. What page are they singing? We're going to sing one verse. Number 11. As us stand together, just a real quick brief stand, and we're going to sing one verse and then out and, and right back in. But, boy, I guarantee you, God sobered me up in a hurry. Well, that boy got up here about this anger thing. Well, you're not alone in that, Pastor Ridge. I think many of us men can be that way. But I, I'm thankful for that message tonight. Let's sing number 11 tonight. I was sinking deep in sin. Love lifted me. Number 11, let's sing that out tonight. I was sinking deep in sin. Far from the peaceful shore, very deeply stained within, seeking to rise no more. But the master of the sea heard my despairing cry. From the water lifted me, now safe am I. About the size of that boy, and uh, man, I tell you what, just a great guy. Married him. He went had to go all the way to Montana to find a wife. He found her, and he wanted me to fly up her and marry him. And they did, didn't I? How many? Hey, hey Lucas, how many brothers and sisters you got? <laughs> he, he's counting, huh? Six brothers and three sisters. Did he get it right? You think so? All right. Well, we hope so. But uh, anyway, Brother Jason, dear brother in the Lord, and you preach what God put on your heart tonight. Good evening. Let's turn to the book of Genesis chapter 19. I have to say, growing up, I tended to be a pretty patient sort of a person. Didn't have much problem with anger, but there's something about kids I was a patient person. Like the one guy said, I could be a good husband if it wasn't for my wife. I feel like I could be a good dad if it wasn't for my kids. But um, shows us our kids show us a little about ourselves. That's what they do. That's God's mirror He puts in our lives. And uh, it'd be nice to think we could change our kids, but the truth is we can't. God's the one that has to change us. Genesis chapter. 19. This is a sobering chapter to read. It's a sobering story. It's, you see in a chapter like this, some of the ugliest things seem like that are in this earth of the wickedness of sin. Yet God put it in the Bible. And what do you know? We're living in a day and age when I don't think Sodom had anything on what's going on in this world today. But you know what? There was a place called Sodom and somebody lived there. A man that God said, God said he was a just man. Powerful thing. Genesis 19. The Bible says, And there came 
two angels to Sodom at even. And Lot sat in the gate of Sodom, and Lot, seeing them, rose up to meet them, and he bowed himself with his face toward the ground. And he said, Behold now, my lords, turn in, I pray you, into your servant's house, and tarry all night, and wash your feet, and ye shall rise up early, and go on your ways. And they said, Nay, but we will abide in the street all night. And he pressed upon them greatly, and they turned in unto him, and entered into his house, and he made them a feast, and did bake unleavened bread, and they did eat. But before they lay down, the men of the city, even the men of Sodom, compassed the house round, both old and young, all the people from every quarter. And they called unto Lot and said unto him, Where are the men which came into thee this night? Bring them out unto us that we may know them. And Lot went out at the door unto them and shut the door after him and said, I pray you, brethren, do not so wickedly. And I cannot wrap my head around this next verse. Behold now, verse 8, I have two daughters which have not known man. Let me, I pray you, bring them out unto you, and do ye to them as is good in your eyes. Only unto these men do nothing, for therefore came they under the shadow of my roof. For all the things that could be said about old Lot, and all the things that we might like to think about the Christians of America, Lot lived in a place called Sodom and had two virgin daughters still in his home. He was doing something right. Somewhere along the way, doing better than a whole lot of people here, seems like, in America today. Verse number 9 goes on and says, And they said, Stand back. And they said again. By the way, they didn't have any interest in Lot's daughters. Messed up. And they said, Stand back. And they said again, This one fellow came into sojourn, and he will needs be a judge. Now will we deal worse with thee than with them. And they pressed sore upon the man, even Lot, and came near to break the door. But the men put forth their hand, and pulled Lot into the house to them, and shut to the door. And they smote the men that were at the door of the house with blindness, both small and great, so that they wearied themselves to find the door. Don't say they went home. They wearied themselves to get to their house. They wearied themselves to find the door. Verse 12, And the men said unto Lot, Hast thou here any besides son-in-law and thy sons and thy daughters and whatsoever thou hast in the city? Bring them out of this place. Bring them out. Verse 13, For we will destroy this place because the cry of them is waxen great before the face of the Lord. And the Lord has sent us to destroy it. And Lot went out and spake unto his sons-in-law, which married his daughters, and said, Up, get you out of this place, for the Lord will destroy this city. But he seemed as one that mocked unto his sons-in-law. And when the morning arose, then the angels hastened Lot, saying, Arise, take thy wife and thy two daughters which are here, lest thou be consumed in the iniquity of the city. And while he lingered, the men laid hold upon his hand, and upon the hand of his wife, and upon the hand of his two daughters, the Lord being merciful unto him. And they brought him forth and set him without the city. And it came to pass, when they had brought them forth abroad, that he said, Escape for thy life. Look not behind thee, neither stay thou in all the plain. And they said something to Lot. They said, escape to the mountain. Escape to the mountain, lest thou be consumed. I'd like to preach a message tonight called Escape to the Mountain. Let us pray. Our Father, we come before you in Jesus' name. We're utterly dependent upon you tonight. And Father, I ask you to wash and cleanse me. Forgive me of my sin and my iniquity. And I pray tonight that you'd fill me with your spirit. And I pray for your power to deliver the message. I pray that you would speak through me to the hearts of each person that's here. And Lord, help us to see the soberness of the hour in which we live. And Lord, give us a hunger to know you and walk with you. Help us now, I pray. Keep us from any distraction. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Escape to the mountain. Verse number 18, after the angels told Lot to escape to the mountain, here was Lot's response. And Lot said unto them, Oh, not so, my Lord. Behold now, thy servant hath found grace in thy sight. And he did. 
and thou hast magnified thy mercy, and God had, which thou hast showed unto me in saving my life, and I cannot escape to the mountain, lest some evil take me, and I die. Behold, now this city is near to flee unto, and it is a little one. Oh, let me escape thither. Is it not a little one? And my soul shall live. Lot was unwilling to escape to the mountain. We find in this story that the only reason that he finally left the city was because the angels came and took him by the hand and his daughters by the hand, his wife by the hand, and they brought them out of the city. But Lot was not willing to go to the mountain. What was holding him back? You know, I mean, we stop and look at our lives for a minute. Here we are. We live in our own Sodom. We live in a wicked world around us, and it's time that we escape to the mountain. See, it's not like Lot wasn't saved. And I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit on where this is, or where we see this in the Bible. But Lot had vexed his righteous soul with the filthy conversation of the wicked. And he got to the point where when God said, it's time to get out, lest you be destroyed, and it's time to go up to a higher place than where you're at, he was not willing to go, and he was being held back by his family. His family was holding him back from being obedient to God. He was worried about his daughters and sons-in-law that were back in the city. They, When he tried to get them to come, they thought he was just mocking them. They couldn't take him serious and they were unwilling to go and he couldn't leave them there. Not only that, he had his virgin daughters there that weren't ready to go and he had a wife who was there who wasn't ready to go. And because of his family, he was unwilling to leave the city. But not only was his family a part of his problem, but also he had a problem with fear. He was afraid, Lord, oh, we might leave, we head off to the mountain and some evil will take me and I'll die there in the end of verse 19. He was full of fear because, see, Lot had lived in this place and he had vexed his righteous soul as we see in 2 Peter 2, 7 and 8. And this vexation of his soul had so affected Lot that he refused to flee the city and head to the mountain. Instead, he begged God to let him compromise and let me just stay in the valley. I'll move out of Sodom, but let me stay in this place called Zoar. It's just a little city. It's not going to be a big deal, but don't make me go to the mountain. You see, we're looking in the filth of chapter 19, but if you back up just one chapter to chapter 18, you read about a man by the name of Abraham who just a little while ago, just earlier in that same day, had been there and God Himself had met with Abraham on a mountain. Abraham went to a mountain to meet with God. And that is where Lot was to go. God said, I want you to flee. I want you to get to a mountain. I want you to go up higher than where you are. But Lot wanted to stick with the valley. Here's an interesting thing. Lot begged God to let him compromise and stay in the valley. And you know what? God allowed Lot to compromise. God allowed it. God gave him the okay in the end to stay in the valley. We find this Verse 20, read one more time. Behold, now this city is near to flee unto, and it is a little one. Oh, let me escape thither. Is it not a little one? And my soul shall live. And he said unto him, See, I have accepted thee concerning this thing also, that I will not overthrow this city for the which thou hast spoken. Haste thee, escape thither, for I cannot do anything till thou become thither. Therefore the name of the city was called Zoar. God gave Lot the okay to stay in the city of Zoar in the valley. Realize that God's allowance is not God's approval. God allowed Lot to stay in the valley, but God did not approve 
of Lot staying in the valley. It cost him very dearly. As we read through the rest of this chapter, we're going to find that the very things that Lot could not leave the city of Sodom over, his wife, his family, his daughters, are the very thing that he lost because he chose to compromise. He said, I can't go to the mountain. I'm scared too. There's too much to lose. Let's just go part way to the mountain. Let's just go far enough to be away from the evil, but let's not go all the way where God's at. Verse 23 says, The sun was risen upon the earth when Lot entered into Zoar. Then the Lord rained, fi uh, rained upon Sodom and upon Gomorrah brimstone and fire from the Lord out of heaven. And he overthrew those cities and all the plain and all the inhabitants of the cities and that which grew upon the ground. But his wife looked back from behind him and she became a pillar of salt. There he's lost one. That's just one verse. <laughs> but that is one big verse. Verse 27, and Abraham got up early in the mountain, I'm sorry, got up early in the morning to the place where he stood before the Lord, and he looked toward Sodom and Gomorrah and toward all the land of the plain, and behold, and, and beheld, and lo, the smoke of the country went up as the smoke of a furnace. And it came to pass when God destroyed the cities of the plain that God remembered Abraham and sent Lot out of the midst of the overthrow when he overthrew the cities in the, which Lot dwelt. And Lot went up out of Zoar and dwelt in the mountain and his two daughters with him, for he feared to dwell in Zoar. And he dwelt in a cave, he and his two daughters. After that experience, he's free to Zoar now too. Verse 31, And the firstborn said unto the younger, Our father is old, and there is not a man in the earth to come in unto us after the manner of all the earth. Come, let us make our father drink wine, and we will lie with him, that we may preserve seed of our father. And they made their father drink wine that night. And the firstborn went in and lay with her father, and he perceived not when she lay down, nor when she arose. Pretty twisted, messed up situation. And verse 34, And it came to pass on the morrow that the firstborn said unto the younger, Behold, I lay yesterday night with my father. Let us make him drink wine this night also, and go thou in and lie with him, that we may preserve seed of our father. And they made their father drink wine that night also. And the younger arose and lay with him, and he perceived not when she lay down nor when she arose. Thus were both the daughters of, daughters of Lot with child by their father. And the firstborn bare a son and called his name Moab, the same as the father of the Moabites unto this day. And the younger she bare, she also bare a son and called his name ben Ami, the same as the father of the children of Ammon unto this day. And we find the results of this mess are two wicked nations, the Moabites and the Ammonites. You see, Lot wanted to compromise and begged to stay in the valley, but in the end, he ended up on the mountain anyway. By the time the story's over, Lot ended up where he was told to go to begin with, but because of his compromise and holding back from being obedient to God and going where he was told to go, it cost him everything that he was trying to keep. He lost his daughters and sons-in-law in the city of Sodom. He lost his sons and daughters-in-law in Sodom. He lost his wife there in Zoar when she looked back. He lost his daughters in the cave when he finally went up there on the mountain. Matthew chapter 10, I want us to look at our own lives. Matthew chapter 10 and verse number 37. Matthew chapter 10 and verse 37. The Bible says, He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. He that findeth his life shall lose it. And he that loseth his life for my sake shall find it. Sometimes in this earth it's hard to be obedient to God when our eyes are upon our families around us and we're worried about our children 
children are worried about our wife or maybe your wife is pulling back against you and she's holding on to something and instead of standing up for what's right and being obedient to God, it's easy to compromise and find a middle ground instead of being obedient to God. But it's time that we as Christians escape to the mountain. You can't afford not to. We better get as close to God as we can get. We better get as close to Him as we can get. It's not worth the cost. He that findeth his life shall lose it. Okay, he held on to what he loved. But he lost it all. And what a cost in the end. You think it's going to work better for you? <laughs> Luke chapter 14, Jesus told pretty much the exact same thing he did here in Matthew. He that findeth his life will you lose it. You better love God more than you love your family. That's a hard thing. I remember when I got married, and the Bible said... To love your wife as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. And yet, the same God tells me to love the Lord my God with all my heart and all my soul and all my mind and all my strength. How do you love him with all your heart and love a wife as well? And love her as Christ loved the church. It's a powerful thing. But the truth is, you can't love God without loving people. <laughs> but we better be careful when we life. We love our wife so much that we're willing to compromise what God has told us to do in order to keep her happy. Amen. We're in trouble when we love our children so much that we're willing to compromise what God has told us to do in order to make them happy. It's time that we escape to the mountain and get close to God. James chapter 4, verse number 1. The book of James chapter 4. This is a powerful little passage of Scripture. Verse 1 says, From whence come wars and fightings among you? Ah, I think Lot had some of them going on right there in his own house. Come they not hence even of your lusts that war in your members? Ye lust and have not, ye kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. Ye fight in war, yet ye have not because ye ask not. This is what the battle that goes on in your heart and my heart. Verse 3, ye ask and receive not, because ye ask amiss, that ye may consume it upon your lust. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God. Lot was better friends with his wife and with his children than he was with God. That's why he couldn't bear to drag them out. He wanted to please them. Whosoever, therefore, will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. What about you and I? Do you think that the Scripture saith in vain, The Spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy, but he giveth more grace? Wherefore he, he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. You see, Sodom was a wicked place, and America today is a wicked place. And the wickedness that we see on the outside is an ugly thing. But you know, the root of it all is something called pride. Isn't it interesting of all things? That's the name that the Sodomites have chosen as their banner is pride. Pride. And it's wicked when we see it in their lives. But what does God see when he looks at me? And I stand in my pride and my self-righteousness. And I resist him. See, if you're going to flee to the mountain, we've got to learn to humble ourselves. Verse 7 of James 4. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. I like to focus on that part of resisting the devil. Resist him. Hold back, and we ought to. But let me tell you, there is no way you're going to have the power to resist the devil if you first don't submit to God. You first don't submit to God. For Lot, it was escape to the mountain. What is it with you? 
What's your mountain that God is calling to you? The place where you're supposed to go to get closer to God. See, I know a little bit about being convicted of sin. I know what it is to have a calling of God on my life that I've resisted. I know what it is to hold on to sin and resist Him. What's God dealing with you about today? You say we can condemn old Lot real quick for the mess he made. But you resist in God's the same thing. You're looking for your compromise. And you're looking to stay in your little valley. Lord, free me from this wickedness that's around me. But don't make me go all the way up there where you are. Let me kind of stay here in between where it's a little more comfortable. But he is a friend of the world. The friendship with the world is enmity against God. Escape to the mountain. Go as high as you can and get as close to God as you can. You know, Abraham in Genesis 18 communed with God on a mountain. Moses saw God's glory where? On a mountain. The Ten Commandments were given to Moses on a mountain. Elijah saw the fire of God fall on a mountain. Jesus was transfigured before the disciples on a mountain. Jesus was crucified and gave his life to save my soul on a mountain. And one of these days soon, he's going to return. And when he does, his feet will touch this earth, not in a valley, but on a mountain. It's time to escape to the mountain. Get as close to him as you can. Stop resisting God. And submit yourself, therefore, to God and resist the devil. We get that verse backwards so often. And we sit in our seat or sit in our couch and resist the Lord instead of resisting the devil. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. If he deals with your heart, humble yourself before him. Humble yourself before him. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil. He will flee from you. Let's escape to the mountain. Simpson pulled in a while ago, and he's going to finish us out tonight. And so then we'll have just a good time to fellowship, and that ice cream be waiting on you over there. And the food place over there, that's got an amen out of here. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, I'll just say this to you, Brother Mike Carver's over here. He'll be preaching in the morning. I uh, see, Brother, uh, come back there. I'm not sure when I've got you lined up, okay, but i got you lined up. I'd look at my list. Brother Mike Hutzel's over here. He'll be, I think he's preaching in the morning. And uh, anyway, a lot of them are getting rolled in here. So, can't hear me? Well, anyway, sing. <laughs> here we go. Yeah, I'm sorry. Here we go. Let's turn to number 252 tonight. I want to sing verse 2. I think this kind of goes along a little bit with Jason's message. My heart, I hope this is true of us tonight. My heart has no desire to stay where doubts arise and fears dismay. Some may dwell where these abound. My prayer, my aim is higher ground. May that be our prayer tonight. Let's sing that verse number two, number 252 tonight. My heart has no desire to stay Where doubts arise and fears dismay Though some may dwell where these abound My prayer, my aim is higher ground Lord, lift me up and let me stand By faith on heaven's table land A higher plane than I have found Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. All right, Brother Roman, you ready to go? All right, so all be seated. And uh, Brother Roman.
Brother Romans, come on up here and preach. I think they've about got him right there. Like I said, we got a lot of preaching in our church, and I want him to have a chance to preach and so forth. By the way, Brother Phipps is on his way. Brother Conister, how are you doing out there? Who's that lady sitting beside you? You know, you know, I thought that she was your mother, but she's, uh, Karen said she's your grandmother. Is that right? Well, I'll tell you what, somebody's holding her age real good. I don't know which one, but one of you is holding her real good. <laughs> but uh, anyway, Brother Phipps just texted me, and he said, Reg, my flight got delayed by about three hours, but he said, I'm still coming. So anyway, he'll be here. To, he'll be preaching tomorrow. If you've never heard him, he's, he's, he's quite the captain. So uh, Brother Roman, come on over here a little bit. This guy here, uh, I've known a lot of his family for a long time. They're local people. And I tell you, he's got some relatives. They always stood for God. I appreciated that. And that, th- how many kids you got? Ten. Ten. I mean, if, around here, if you ain't got eight or ten kids, you just ain't in the loop. Amen. I mean, <laughs> no, we love you, no matter if you got any kids. But uh, uh, Jason there had nine. He's got ten. And I tell you, we're having a blast with all these kids. I'm not kidding you right now. We're having a wonderful blast. But he's been a blessing to me and all of his family. And uh, by the way, this is also courting season. So we got a lot of young people here, and I heard there's already sparks flying through the air. I don't know whether that's true or not. But you know, a good place to meet somebody to marry is a church. Ain't too bad, amen? And the camp meeting's an awful good place. But anyway, I'll shut up and let you preach. Uh, you get in there, about, give you about 20, 30 minutes, and we're going to have a break, and then Brother Ronnie's going to come in tonight. If you need this, you don't need this. Do you? No, I don't, no, no, I don't need it for sure. <laughs> All right. If you would, go ahead and turn over your Bibles to... This evening over to First Peter two, First Peter two, that's be we're just going to be reading one scripture there. But uh, tell you a little bit of background here as far as I've been studying this week, trying to find something uh, for the the camp meeting. Not knowing for sure, you know, Reggie just tries to follow the Lord's will whenever you're supposed to speak, and it's it's been trouble for me this week. I'll be honest, I've just been looking and. God's not been speaking to me about it. It's like, that's just not it. I mean, I'm good. I'm reading the Bible and uh, getting in there trying to do something and all that. But it just wasn't, it wasn't what the Lord was waiting on my heart. Well, so I, uh, anyways, he calls me this afternoon, or I end up calling him. And it's like, the Lord is in it. That's all I can tell you, because a minute off the, when I, a minute after I get off the phone, I mean, the Lord just starts dealing with me going down the road, and I just get to, the Lord is speaking to my heart about uh, what to bring here tonight, and it, it's just like, man, it, it's just the, the perfect timing. I, I don't, and it, you know, and it's one of those things that, you know, I work most of, the, uh, most of the day, and I get home, and I have a few minutes to try to study and put some verses together, and I think that was the Lord's will that I didn't have a bunch of time to actually just do it. I, I, I live it off the Spirit and let Him uh, speak tonight, but just let the Lord uh, do His will in the service and in this meeting tonight. Okay, if you first Peter chapter 2 and verse... 21. We're going to read one scripture and we'll go to the Lord in prayer and then we'll continue on from there. For even hereunto were ye called because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that we should follow his steps. Bow with me in prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you again for this night you give me. Thank you for the messengers that's already been brought to, forth tonight, Lord, for the message that's brought to Lucas and to Jason, Lord, and the, the words of encouragement that they, they give it to me, Lord. And I just pray, Lord, that we would be willing to, to climb that mountain, Lord, that we wouldn't want to just fall short of uh, just making it halfway up, Lord. As they, so often, us as people, we get caught up in it, saying, oh, this is good enough, and this is good enough, Lord, but we're not always all there, Lord. And I just pray, Lord, that we have a, a desire to, to want to be holy. A desire to, to be closer to you, Lord. I pray that you be with me tonight, Lord. Anoint my, my voice, anoint my heart, my soul tonight, Lord, to, to bring word as you ought, as I ought to, Lord. Be with the hearts and minds here tonight, Lord, that they be clear of this outside world and they would be attentive to your word or attentive to the messenger that you bring, Lord. Help me not to get any glory in myself tonight, Lord, but it would be glory unto you, Lord, and that we would not be doing any of this out of self-righteousness, but to give glory to God the Almighty. We thank you today, this evening, the opportunity we have to hear it again. Be with us tonight. In Jesus' name, we love you. Amen. So as we read that verse one more, once more again, For even here unto were we called, because Christ also suffered for us. 
Leaving us an example. What example did He leave us? I mean, you just think about the life of Jesus Christ. He called us to be part of His family, to be in love with Him, and He given us an example that we should follow His steps. The steps of, of righteousness, the steps of love, the steps of, of dying to life, to live. The willingness to step forward for one another and, and be there for another and showing that love. He, because of Christ, because of Him, we have reasons to follow His example. And, and I want us to uh, turn over into 1 Samuel, a good uh, scripture. You guys all know the, these verses here, but we're going to read them. 1 Samuel 17, starting with verse 23. We're going to read there. And we'll probably stop them amongst us as we go. But you guys, you guys know the story, and you guys know most of the background here. I'm sure most of you. But uh, the Lord is going to bring forth a few exclamations through this. And as he, he talked with them, behold, there came up a champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, out of the armies of the Philistines, and spake according to the same words. And David heard them. And all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were sore afraid. And the men of Israel said, Have ye seen this man that come up surely to defy Israel? Is he come up? And he it shall be that this man who killeth him, the king will enrich him with great riches and will give him his daughter and make his father's house free. Free. Uh, just a second here. Free in Israel. And David spake to the men that stood by him, saying, What shall be done to the man that kills the Philistine and taketh away the reproach of, from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? And we're going to continue to read there a couple more, but remember that verse right there. And the people answered after this manner, saying, So shall it be to the man that killeth him, and Eliab, his eldest brother, heard when he spake unto the men. And Eliab's anger was kindled against David. And he said, Why camest thou down hither? And why thou hast thou left those few in the wilderness? I know thy pride and thy haughtiness of thine heart. For thou art come down that thou mightest see the battle. And David said, What have I done? Is there not a cause? I don't really title messages a lot often. I, I guess I just never been taught that or whatever. I just a guy that the Lord speaks to sometimes, and I try to make a little note and jot it and and be attentive to the the the, the will of God in my heart and His the Spirit of Holy Ghost. And uh, but if I was going to name this one, a cause for holiness. You see, David said, "What have I done? Is there not a cause?" And he was talking to his, his uh, brothers there. He was talking to the Israelites there. And if you go back to that verse again, as we talked about there in the end of verse 36, uh, for who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? There was a cause that he had. He said there was a living God. It wasn't a God that was dead. It wasn't a God of Baal or any other God that they were serving. It was a God that was alive. And we have a cause tonight ourselves. We have a God that is alive. He's not dead. He's not some little statue or a golden image. He's not some uh, ball player that you see on the television screen occasionally. He's not some book that you read about all the time. He is alive. He's well. He's living in my soul. He's living in your soul, I hope. And I'm telling you, He's given us a cause to live for Him. He's given us a cause to have righteousness in our life. He's given us a cause. We continue reading and He turned from... He toward another and spake after this manner. And the people answered again after the former manner. And when the words were heard which David spake, he rehearsed them before Saul and sent for him. And David said to Saul, Let no man's heart fail because of him. Thy servant will go and fight with this Philistine. And Paul and Saul said to said to David, Thou art not able to go against the Philistine to fight with him, for thou art but a youth and 
he, a man of war from his youth. Let's stop there for a minute. And we kind of go back a little bit into Jason's message, I guess, a little bit here. But, you know, we, we have all these outside focuses telling us about different things that we are not able or can't, uh, can't accomplish. And the Lord's telling us one other thing and they're telling us another. And sometimes it's our own flesh and blood. Sometimes it's our, our best friends. Maybe it's our co-workers. And maybe it is just the person off the street that's just uh, making you think that this isn't the right way to go here and there. But we need to be focused on the signs of God that He gives us through His Scripture. The, the dwelling of the Holy Spirit in our lives and being listening and to them and being obedient to Him. Yeah, sometimes nature itself tells us one thing and, and tells us to do it another way. Maybe uh, the tradition is to do it a different way. But I'm here to tell you, you don't listen to that king and that president so often. You listen to the mighty king, the one who is still alive. Again, like I said, he is trying to, they're trying to defy the armies of the living God. Sometimes it's our own flesh and blood doing that. Sometimes it's that little brain inside of us telling us that we can't do that. That God's telling us to go ahead, mount up like eagles. And we continue on. In verse 33, And Saul said, Thou art not able to go against the Philistine to fight with him, for thou art but a youth and a man of war, uh, a man of war from his youth. Again, I want to stop there for a minute. So he gave him an excuse. You're just youth. You're too little. You know, every one of us are going to have the same doubts in our mind. I can tell you, it's gone through my life even as a child. I'm too little. I'm unable. I'm incapable of doing such things. I'm un- and I'm sure as any, any preacher here probably has stood behind a pulpit and preached and answered the call of the priest before you answered. He said, I'm unable. I'm incapable. I'm, uh, I'm not willing. And I can't do it. You know, we hear of a few people in the Bible that did the same thing. Moses and and Jonah, and you keep on going and going, and Peter even denied Christ, and different things like that. People say and give excuses all the time that there's some circumstance in your life you can't, you can't talk clearly, you can't think clearly. I'm not very smart. I don't know how to understand and study the Bible very well. And you keep on going those things over and over and over in your mind, and you say, I'm unable. And you can have the same excuse. And if people can give you that excuse... But are you serving a living God? And David said unto Saul, Thy servant kept thy father's sheep. And there came a, a lion and a bear and took a lamb out of the flock. And I went out after him and smote him and delivered it out of the mouth by his beard and smote him and slew him. And the servant slew both the lion and the bear and the uncircumcised Philistines shall be on one of them, saying, I have defied the... Seeing he had to fight the armies of the living God. He went with a, a desire. He went with passion. He had a, a, he had a earnesty in his heart that he knew he was able and capable because he had seen Jesus do it in his life before. Can you tell me of a, an instance in your own life when you've seen Jesus prevail in your life and, and, and he went and he welled on that, those giants and he got rid of them for you. you the time that you came to the salvation. You remember that giant that he conquered? Remember the time that you maybe even uh, laid down your, your head and you you allowed him to use your life and answer that calling that he put in your life and you allowed him to take a hold of who you were and how he slayed the giants of, of doubt because we serve a living God. We have an opportunity to live holy unto him realizing that yes, there's a lot of things going on in this world that can deter us. But we serve a living God. And David said, Moreover, the Lord that delivers me out of the paw of the lion and out of the paw of the bear, he will deliver me out of the hand of the Philistine. And Saul said unto David, Go, and the Lord be with thee. He will deliver thee. It's a promise he's given you. You follow his will, he'll give you the direction. He will deliver you. Follow his will. And Saul armed David with his armor. And he put a helmet of brass upon his head and also armed him with the coat of mail. And David girded the sword upon his armor and essayed to go. And he had not proved it. And David said unto Saul, I cannot go with these, for I have not proved them. And David put them from off him. And I preached up something about that, those verses here a couple weeks ago or whatever. But we don't always have to go the way the world's trying to teach us. Just because that's the way it's always been done doesn't mean that's the way the Lord wants it done. Be obedient to Him. Let's go ahead and turn over again to Titus 2. Titus chapter 2. But speak thou the things which be 
come sound doctrine. That the aged men be sober, gray, temperate, sound in the faith and charity and patience. And I'm, I can't stop at every one of these little moments here. I'm going to keep, keep on trucking. But B, this is how the, these are some ways to be holy. And then that first verse I talked about, how because of Christ and he, the example He set before us, these are some of the things that we can live in our life. And because we have a living God on our side, we are able to conquer. That the aged men, again, be sober, grave, temperate, sound in faith and charity and patience. You're loving. You're, you're in your word. You're faithful to the gospel. You're faithful to the cause of Christ. And you're, in, you're patient. You're willing to, to, to spend the time that it takes to do things right. The aged women likewise, that they be, be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things. No more gossiping. No gossiping out there. Not accusing one another here and there. Uh, you know, take blame yourself when you need to, and otherwise try to exhort one another and uplift them in the Lord. Being teachers of the good things of the Word. That they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children. You're giving an illustration and example to them. To be discreet, chaste, keepers of home, good, obedient to their own husbands. That the Word of God be not blasphemed. Just let the Word speak to you right now. Let it preach to you. <clears throat> Young men likewise exhort to be sober-minded in all things showing thyself a pattern of good works in doctrine showing uncorruptness, gravity, sincerity. Sound speech. We'll stop there for just a moment and I'm hitting that one for a little bit. A pattern of good works, first of all. What is your pattern? What's your path? What's your, your, your pattern is the example you're setting before the world. It's the example you're setting before fellow Christians. The example that you're, you're, you're hanging your hat on. That's your pattern. How do people read that book that you're written in your life? That's your, that's your, what chapter are you in in that book and how are they reading it? That's the pattern that they see. Okay, now let's get back here to... A pattern of good works. And doctrine showing uncorruptness, gravity, and sincerity. Sound speech. What is your speech? Are we worried? And I'm not. And I'm. Uh, well, first of all, if it's filthy liqueur, liqueur, just get it out of your mouth. Don't need to be a part of it. There's no. There's no place for it. We don't need to be uh, saying saying words that's not appropriate. We don't need to be bringing people down and talking nasty about different things or or whatever it might be. Just get rid of it. But now let's talk about a little bit more in the sound speech. Is your speech just about everyday uh, things going on? Or is your speech about the Lord Jesus Christ? I, I remember a song growing up. It said, it's called Get All Excited. And it's, the song says, talk about the people, talk about things that really don't matter at all. But it says, get outside, go tell everybody about Jesus Christ, my King. Are you excited about telling about Jesus or are you more excited about the rain that might be getting ready to come down? Are you more excited about what tomorrow holds? Or are you more excited about this or that? Your friendship with this, or this person or that person. And we need to love those people. I'm not, I'm not trying to get away from that. Sound speech. Sound speech about the Holy Ghost of God, about the, the Word of God telling your brothers and sisters, and I'm as guilty as any of you here. I, I mean, I, yeah, sure, maybe today I invited a few people to the camp meeting, but how often do I really speak to them about Christ? That's sound. The weather don't really matter that much. The days are going to go on. Sound speech that cannot be condemned. You, only, you can't give him a reason to condemn it, okay? That he that is of the contrary part might be ashamed, having no evil thing to say of you. Exhort servants, exhort servants to be obedient unto their own masters and to, be, and to please them well in all things, not answering again, not prolonging, but showing all good fidelity that they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in all things, that you're adorning Him in all things. We're going to continue to read the rest of the chapter there. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation that hath appeared to all men, teaching us that defying ungodliness and worldliness, lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present world, looking for the blessed hope 
and that glorious appearing of our great God and our Savior Jesus Christ. Isn't that what you're looking forward to? Let, let, let's, let's thrive for that day. Let's get excited about it. Let's, let's live for Him who gave Himself for us that He might redeem us of all, from all iniquity and purify unto Himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. Are you zealous of good works? That, you mean you have a desire, you have a thrive, you have an energy within you to do the good works of the God. You, you know those, those uh, get the fruits of the Spirit that it talks about in Galatians 5. Do, do you have a zeal to feel those, those fruits? Do you have a zeal to conquer that with God? Are you, are you, do you have a zeal to have the living God come through you and speak into this world? These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise thee. Those are some strong words. I bet each and every one of us almost could probably look back at this last week and we could think where someone probably could despise us. I got a young man from work that I can remember that I can see where he might be a little despising of me right now, maybe, from this week. How about yourself? It's a hard thing to live up to this. It's not because we're doing it though. I think that's the problem. A lot of times we want to, we try to meet God in the middle. Brother Jason was talking about. We try to, we try to go halfway up the mountain. And we're not willing to give up every single part of our life. And those little things that we might not be calling God, but they might be a little bit of an idol to us. And therefore, men will despise us. Because we're not allowing God to take over Hebrews 12. Hebrews 12. Twelve and thirteen. I want to read those two verses there. Wherefore lift, wherefore, lift up you the hands which hang down and thy feeble knees. And make straight the path of your feet, lest that, that which is lame be turned out of the way, but let it rather be healed. <coughs> but let it rather be healed. Once again, we don't serve a guy, a God that's dead. We serve a God that brought his 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 son to this world. He died upon a cross, was buried. And was laid there for three days and resurrected. And he is alive. He's not dead anymore. He's not in the tomb any longer. So lift up those feeble hands that which hang down. Lift them up. You have a reason to rejoice. He's alive again. And make straight the path of your feet. That means don't make your feet go wavering back and forth. So that the people that's watching you, that's the Bible, that, that they're reading, that they're thinking, man, this is a curvy road and I don't know. I might not be able to stay on it. And I'm going to get out in the ditch and the deer might come out at me. Give it a straight path. Give them direction and guidance. That your feet. Uh, make straight the path of your feet. Lest that which is lame be turned out of the way. They're watching you. But let those one that are falling away, rather than be healed. That they see direction, not because of what you did, but because of what Jesus did in you. They can be healed of their sins, they can be healed of their hurt and their pain. They can be healed, healed of whatever going on in their life. If they see you reflecting Jesus. If they see you trying to be that God, guy, that, that person that God wants. When they try to see you living in His will, what is the will of God in your life? <clears throat> is there not a cause? I think there is a cause again. John three sixteen. For God so loved the world that gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. He get, I think God's seen the cause. God's seen a cause. God's seen a, a dying world that needed a Savior. And then he, he looked in the world maybe and didn't find anybody. I know this isn't how it goes because it was planned from the beginning. But he knew there was no one out there in the world that could do it. So he sent his son. And he seen a cause to send his son, his only begotten son, to this world that he would die. And that he'd be tortured with pain. And that people would frown upon him. And people would beat on him. And people would talk bad about him. 
You know, we don't like it when people talk about us. We don't like when people spit on us. We don't like it when we get beat on. We don't like the pain and the suffering. And God sent them to do that for us. Is there not a cause? So that we could have everlasting life. He sent Jesus to die upon the cross so that we could have life. He's seen the cause. Do you see the cause? And I'm... Do you see the cause? We need to be out there fishing for men and women to come to know the love of God. Do you have a cause in your heart? Do you have a desire, a zeal, as it said there in those verses, for the gospel of Christ? Do you have a zeal for the gospel for your family, for your loved ones around you? You know, you probably have cousins or uncles, aunts, out there, I, I'll be ashamed to tell you, I haven't spoke to my uncle probably, he only lives 10 miles down the road, and probably two or three years about the Lord. Last time I did talk to him, it was about the Lord, but... Does that mean, does he, does he understand there's a, there's a right way, there's a wrong way? Does he know? Same with you guys, the people that you know. People that should see Jesus in you. Are you out there fishing for Jesus? As it says in Luke 19, for the Son of Man has came to seek and to save that which is lost. And your example of holiness, your example of living God, not for self-righteousness, but living for God, is one way you can seek and save that which is lost. Because any old preacher can get up here behind a pulpit and speak a, good, a few good words about the Lord. But when they go out there into the rest of their life, and you have a brother or sister that's with you every day, they know what you're really speaking. And they might have just lost it because of you. We need to seek and save that which is lost. Why not for ourselves? Because there is a cause, because we serve a living God. Stand together tonight. We're going to take. Can you get the lights on? Somebody flip the lights on over there, and uh, appreciate that good message. And always remember, there's a cause, and that's why we're having this camp meeting because there is a cause. And so I tell you what we're going to do. What time is it? Set. Is that seven o'clock? Are we that early? Man, I tell you what, we're going to get. I didn't think we'd get you in the pulpit till eight o'clock. Well, let's take. I tell you what, let's do. Let's take a ten to fifteen minute break. Use the bathroom. Uh, but don't forget the ice cream after church. You know, you don't forget that. But take about a ten minute break. Use the bathroom. Whatever. Come back in here, and I want all the young people. Come, all the young people come back up, and we'll kick in with the song again. And then Brother Ronnie's uh, going to preach for us tonight. And I don't know. We might do something a little bit odd afterward. We might do something a little bit unusual afterward. Depends on what time, how long he preaches. But I, I don't got him on a limit. He's old enough. He can preach as long as he wants to. So you're dismissed. And be back in here. Let's be back in at 7.15. How about that? 7.15. We'll be back in here.